my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Brian Harris, the man behind the still highly regarded, though sadly no longer with his angling magazine, proposed Dave Stewart, who I'm linking up with here, as the best all-round angler the UK has ever produced. What better accolade is there than that? And not only a practical angler, but also an avid writer from way back in the days of Bernard Venables and Creel to the present, which is 2014. Let's start with the journalism. How did all that come about? Well, before I start on all that chit-chat, I think I'd better apologise to many friends who will have heard much of it before or read it. Though I hope not all of it, but as they all tell me I talk too much anyway, they probably have. Now, regarding Brian Harris being kind about my angling abilities, I think the fact that I could write about practically any subject on angling that he wanted me to, not just catching fish of different species, but also the politics and views about authorities and such, were the reasons he wanted me to write for him. Apart from editors wanting me to write articles for their magazines, my first two books were both within a series of angling books. I was approached by the editors to ask if I would write them. First book I ever wrote was for the How to Catch Them series, and that was a book on carp. What is surprising is that I was only 25 when asked to write that. It went through a few editions too, so that says something for it, I guess, and I had anglers writing me about all sorts of things afterwards. Some of them became good friends. Perhaps, to justify Brian Harris for his opinion about me before I carry on chatting, I should here also mention a few other well-known names besides Harris also thought I was a capable angler and some had different species in mind than carp. Still, as I've mentioned carp, one fan of mine was the great Bob Church, who in his book Big Carp named Walker and me as his mentors. Also, he dedicated the book to me, and I've got the book here with me so I can quote. This is what he wrote. I certainly learned so much from Dave in those early days. He then goes on to say, He helped the carp fishing scene get going. And just look at it today. Of course, as Kay and I fished for carp and promoted it a bit when showing our amateur films about all sorts of fishing from around 1955 and giving chats to clubs, I will accept some of the blame for the big fish craze that dominates angling today. Bob also knows I did well enough at the fly fishing lark too. <laughs> One of my best friends was a very good angler. Well, he learned it from me, so he had to be ha-ha. He was John Denman, and he and I fished Graffham for the first time at Bob's invitation. We were to fish from the bank. It was a damn cold morning, too. We decided to stay in my camper van for a while, blow getting out in that. Anyway, about mid-morning, we wandered down to the spaces they had left for us between a lot of very well-known fly fishermen. Tom Ivans and Dick Shrives, just to name a couple. I'd already shown John how to cast with shooting heads. That wasn't generally known then. So we both made a long cast. In fact, it was a very long cast, if I remember. But we both got a fish first cast. We didn't know then that that damn fish had been caught. We used a fly I'd got John to make because he was a jolly good fly tyre. Thinking about it, he was good at everything. Anyway, as I recall... We both got a limit and not much else was caught. Now, I think it was Eric Allen who introduced himself to me to ask about the fly. It was called a Master Cutler. Anyway, he was so impressed enough about our catch to write a long article about the fly. I don't remember the publication, though. Oh, well. Anyway, more recently, Bob asked me to write a chapter about salmon fishing for his book on game fishing. So already at the start of this chat, we've got carp, trout and salmon. There's yet another species that I mentioned, the guru of pike fishing back in the 60s, Barry Rickards. Not so long ago, although the way for time flies, it might be a couple of years ago, I heard from Keith Armishaw, who along with his wife Sandy, interviewed two known anglers to chat about their angling over the years. The chat is recorded on a disc, which combined with a book is called the Angling Heritage Series. This series is to be part of the history of angling, so that well-known anglers' contributions to the sport doesn't get lost in time. Anyway, 
Keith sent me an email saying that when, along with Des Taylor, Barry was being interviewed for the second one of the Angling Heritage series, when asked who was his greatest influence, he replied Dave Stewart. Talking about that series, the two anglers interviewed for the fourth book in the series were two famous game anglers, John Goddard and Brian Clark. During the interview, John insisted that in their book they use a picture of me with a salmon of 32 and a half pounds, beneath which he wanted the caption to read, The Brilliant Dave Stewart, how about that? <laughs> of course, that wasn't the biggest English salmon, which was a tad under 40 pounds. In Alaska, I got the 51 pounds. Oh, and Bob Church and I have done the fifth book in the series. The late Peter Stone became a good friend. At a reading about him given by his friend Peter Drennan, he named Dave Stewart as Peter's mentor. Now that really surprised me because I thought it would have been Dick Walker because they were great friends. But he named me, so I really was surprised. So we have anglers saying I influenced carp, pike and salmon fishing and thinking about it, we talk about yet another species, barbel. The late John Searle told me he based all his barbel fishing and fishing for many other species on my writings. Oh, and by the way, I've just been made Vice President of the Barbel Society. Also, even John's fairly recent book about Avon Roach fishing, for which I wrote a chapter, in an article about the book, well-known John Bailey wrote that for him my chapter was the best, and he said something about centre pins and trotting too. Oh, wait a minute, I know what it was. He said he learned more about trotting and the centre pin in ten minutes from my chapter than he'd learned all his life. I'm sure it was something like that. I'm not, I mean, without trying to find the book and having a look, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm pretty certain that's what he said. Anyway, John Bailey, his name reminds me that he also used a lot of my material about salmon fishing in southern England for his book on salmon. Mind you, he did credit me for it. Talking about John Searle's Roach book again, I've just remembered, and I keep saying I remembered, but I'm 85. Anyway, I was asked to write a book about roach fishing back in the 70s. So apart from all the other species, the big species, over 30 years before I wrote about roach for John Searle, it was considered that I knew a bit about roach fishing, so I was asked to write the roach book then. Anyway, now we've got roach to add to the all-rounder thing that people thought I was good enough to write about. So perhaps Brian Harris was right to say I was an all-rounder and knew a lot about many species, many more than I've just talked about, and all my bragging justifies this interview. But then my wife Kay was also a damn good all-rounder, and she kicked my ass a few times, I can tell you. Perhaps to emphasise the all-round a bit, Kay caught 89 species, and I caught a lot more than that. That's enough of that. Time to talk about something else. Now, this tackle dealer business, as a young lad I became a fishing tackle dealer. What better for an obsessive angler? Working in a tackle shop gave me a great life. Talking fishing all the time, I was learning while instructing customers how to do this and that, describing tackle and methods as talking to them gave me new ideas. But how I got into the business is a story in itself. It started when I was only 17 and I was suddenly coughing up blood, mouthfuls of blood. The friend I was with took me to the nearest doctor, which he knew, and I was hanging on to the pillar of his porch, spewing up masses of blood. Doctor came out, looked at me, never said a word, Next thing I know, there's an ambulance arriving and they carted me off to Richmond Hospital. In the hospital, they put me to bed, and then doctors were coming to see me one after the other. But the flow of blood was slowing down, not filling the collection thing under my chin, so that was something. But the next morning it had almost stopped, so apart from coughing up a bit of blood, I was feeling better. And they then moved me outside onto a balcony. It was a covered-in balcony that surrounded a courtyard and it was warm with radiators and that was just as well because during the four months I was there, 1946-1947, we had one of the coldest winters on record and the courtyard filled with about three feet of snow. I was diagnosed with tuberculosis back in those days called the White Man's Scourge as it killed hundreds. I was then moved to Ashford Hospital in Middlesex for a few months and then into a double cubicle in Harefield Hospital near Uxbridge. It was a great place, that, after the 
being surrounded by glass, I was looking out onto a large lawn bounded by trees, and in fine weather the patient's beds were pushed out onto a balcony there. The folding doors were never shut, whatever the weather. Actually, that's not quite true, as although I was there over a year, they were shut once during a pea soup or a fog. But one was also provided with as many blankets as wanted, and there was underfloor heating. To save boredom, patients wove carpets, silk dashi sets, painted and did a few other things, and I made a few dashi sets myself, and the great aunt who raised me, as I didn't have a mother, used to visit me each week, would take them and sell them, goodness knows where. She also used to bring me the fishing gazette, and in that I saw an advert for rod-making kits from J.B. Walker of Hive. So I ordered one with the money from the dashi sets. It was only a three-piece tonking button little section with a green art top joint, but I finished it well with the top close whipped. One of the orders I'd got friendly with sold it to a tackle shop in Watford and the tackle dealer asked for more. Tackle was very scarce after the war, as tackle-making firms were turned over to various projects for the war effort. Firms that made reels made parts for small arms and so on. Anyway, I ordered another kit, and soon progressed and ordered more expensive split cane kits. I just could not make enough of the tackle guy, but I was somewhat restricted. The ward sister wasn't at all happy with it, as she grumbled about the dust from rubbing down cork handles, especially in the winter when the beds were not wheeled out onto the balcony, although the doors were always open. But the physiotherapist, pretty lady she was too, insisted that for a young man of 18, yes, I'd had a birthday since I went to the hospital at 17, for a young man confined, he had to do something he was really interested in. One of the male nurses would also take him into Watford if he was going there, and he wanted me to make him a rod. As he was so helpful, I wouldn't take any money from him, but he insisted on giving me his accurate wristwatch, as I didn't have a watch then. I had that watch for about 40 years. I can't remember what happened to it either. Anyway, varnishing rods would have been a problem. Behind the bed there was a cupboard to keep a dressing gown and a change of pyjamas and for patients starting to get up on hours it was also for their clothing once they started to do the specified walks around the grounds. It was noticeable that the guys would complain that their walks were well away from the walks the women had to take. No sex please, we're British. After Harefield it was three months convalescent. Then home at last, I'd been in hospital over two years. One of the first thing I did was walk to my beloved Thames and watch some anglers, and I would have liked to have gone fishing, but I had to get home and spend time with my aunt. She was like a mother, although with very strict Victorian discipline. But auntie told me there was a new fishing tackle dealer who'd opened in Richmond, only about a year ago, so I went over for a look. We chatted away and soon I asked him if he had anyone to do his rod repairs. As I'm good at it, I told him. <laughs> I was only 19 years old, and he didn't know me from Adam, but he went out the back and came out with an armful of rods. I want them back next Saturday. I sorted through his rod repair stock for rod rings and whipping. That was all there was to do anyway. There were no feral replacements or major repairs, and he got them back the next Saturday. I suppose I did that for about six, seven months when I was asked to work for the firm. At the time, I was in the accounts offices at BOAC. Now, that was British Overseas Airways Corporation, who eventually, if I remember, they amalgamated British European Airways Corporation became British Airways. But anyway, I'd got a job there after hospitalisation, but I did find it difficult to get a job, as I had to attend Hounslow Chest Clinic half a day each week for treatment. But the fishing tackle business was happy with that, so I left BIAC. Started work in the fishing tackle shop, and of course, apart from repairing rods and reels and making rods, I also had to serve in the shop. I'd only been with the firm a little over eight months when the operation I had to help cure the TB went wrong, so I was immediately put back in hospital. This time I was in for less than six months and had an operation called a thoracoplasty to remove several ribs to permanently collapse most of my right lung. 
And all the time I was in hospital, the firm paid me full wages, and in those days they didn't have to pay me a penny. But I no longer had to go to Hounslow every week, only for a check-up every three months. I won't go into the outs of the shares of Edgar Thurston and Company Limited, the fishing tackle business. Suffice it to say, I owned a quarter of the firm by the time I was 22 and half of it by the time I was 25. And also at 25, I was already writing about fishing, and I've already told you a bit about that. But I suppose the very start of it was when I was only 21 and asked to write for a magazine that described Richmond and Twickenham and many of the interesting aspects in and around those towns. The magazine was called Leisure Hours. They asked me to write a piece about the local fishing, the Thames and so on, so someone even then must have known a bit about me. I guess it was by then I was fishing for several species and even at 21 having success with the bigger species pike and carp and that sort of thing. And when I started reading about fishing by angling writers in those days, I realised I knew enough about fishing to write myself. And anyway, I disagreed with plenty that was written even back then. And that's over 64 years ago. Apart from the articles I did write early on, mostly I was asked to write. Thinking again about that first book that was about carp fish, God, because of this interview, it's sinking in. I was only 25 years of age when I wrote that, and back then hardly anyone was fishing for carp. Anyway, my whole life was already tight to angling from a child, and let's be honest, I certainly didn't know enough about anything else to write about. And while I am being honest, it seems to me there are plenty of writers who don't know enough about angling to write, but they still get their stuff published. Then again, as a youngster, I was probably conceited enough. No change there, is there? I was probably conceited enough to think my stuff would be published, and it was. In fact, I've never had anything rejected. Perhaps this interview will be, but there we are. But one of the things that fishing had to be for me was fun, and sadly I have the feeling that the specimen area we now live in, angling's not always fun. I have been told I put a bit of humour into some of my work. In fact, three guys who read my autobiography, Minnows to Marlin, said it made laugh, but also cry. Now, what do I make of that? I wrote for several publications, and I wrote about the bad state of the river test for the field. The Test and Itching Association asked me to withdraw that article. I guess they want, were very worried about their clients who pay a lot of money to fish on the test. Anyway, I didn't withdraw it, and I got a lot of support in the letter pages. I think the discussion went on for over a year. Even Richard Walker got in on the act and supported my views. Most of these publications asked me to continue writing if they'd already had something from me previously, but one or two asked me to write even when I hadn't written anything for them, like Angling Magazine. I did a few things for Angling Times, and before that, of course, the Fishing Gazette. I've written for a magazine called Fishing, Trout and Salmon, Anglers World, and several other angling magazines I can't remember the names of. When I was asked to write for angling, I was quite pleased, as unlike most of today's publications, it was probably because it covered all types of angling persuasion and politics. It could therefore influence anglers into new areas of fishing without buying several publications, as I love fishing rivers, such as the Stour in the Wimborne area, the Avon at Christchurch, and other rivers including my beloved Thames. All those rivers gave me a large range of species to satisfy my love of variety, and the fishing for all of them taught me a lot. I could fish for such species as chub, roach, dace, grayling, pike, perch, and also the game fishes, salmon, trout, and sea trout. A barbel also fished the Thames and the Kennet, as well as the Avon at Christchurch, and now, of course, I've fished several more rivers for barbel. Christchurch was good to us, though, and I'm saying... Us, because it was Kay and I. Anyway, Kay and I did catch a lot of them there. I think it was about 1960, maybe before that, that I got a sea trout of 11 and a half pounds, and on the same day an 8 pounder. The River Authority of the day informed me that it was the second largest from the river, the record being then 14 pounds, but that's up to about 17 pounds or so now, I believe. Also, I had another double and other good fish that year, so fishing for all species allowed me to write about all of them with some authority, I guess as we were pretty successful. Not with monsters, 
but with many bags of good fish of all the species. We also love still waters, of course, which we obviously fish for carp, but we really loved our tent fishing back in the days when a five-pounder was a whopper and a six-pounder made the news. For a few years, we always started the season after tents, but although we usually started at dawn, in several waters that we fished we found the most prolific part of the day to be middle of the day, even in very hot weather. As far as salmon were concerned back then, we only fished for them in the coarse fish close season, but I had more time then as we didn't open on Sundays until the coarse fishing season reopened. That early in the year, from mid-March, in the stow, the salmon were springers of a good size. In fact, for about five years, we never caught any under 16 pounds. Then I got a 13 pounder that looked like a grouse, you know, slim, very forked tail and so on. And then the odd 10 or 12 pounder would turn up, especially from mid-May onwards when we could start using prawns. I can't remember the date, but my friend John Goddard asked me to get him a salmon for his 25th wedding anniversary. A silver fish for a silver anniversary. So I just went down to the stow and got him a 16 pounder. <laughs> Nowadays I would find it impossible to go anywhere down south and catch a salmon to order in springtime. In fact, I wouldn't even try on my own water, and I know that pretty well. Apart from my annual holiday, it was the same with sea fishing. It would be March onwards. But having end every Sunday off in the close season, if the opportunity was there, Kay and I would sea fish. However, once the course season opened, we were back after them as we followed the seasons around. And of course, we tried to pick the best time of year with our limited time to fish for whatever species we considered would be catchable. In spite of what has been written about us, I've always said we were never specimen hunters. Bloody silly word, anyway, specimen only means average. But anyway, we just went fishing, but like the big species as well as the smaller ones. But we never chased the biggest of the big species. Nevertheless, some good ones came our way occasionally. I never have been and never will be obsessed with the big fish game. Nowadays it seems monster fish at any cost. And I'm certainly not into that. And although I had such limited time, Kay and I caught stacks of fish, so Barn Harris wanted me to write about it all. Great. I did say that we fished for almost every species, game seer or coarse. I said almost, as I'd never caught cats or zander back then. Of course, before angling, I was asked to write for Angler's Mail as their lead writer. Obviously, the publishers, or whoever, like the material I'd already written for other publications. But when IPC took over and made Johnningham editor, he wanted me to write about what I was catching every week, and he expected me to catch big fish every week. As I hope I've already explained, Kay and I only went fishing, not chasing monsters. Also, as I only had one full day off a fortnight and a couple of half days, I just didn't have the time to chase around as a specimen hunter. I'd made a bit of a name simply because I fished for and caught the biggest species as well as the roach, dace, bream and such that most anglers of that time fished for and enjoyed fishing for. But Ingham really wanted a different kind of right than me, ones with plenty of flannel, I think. <laughs> I wasn't happy either, as some of my stuff was edited, which was never done before, and it sometimes altered my style or attitude of fishing. Also... When Angler's Mail went coloured, I thought the first issue was lousy. The colour was out of sync, and a front-page photo of a huge pike, to me, was obviously a fake. All that put me in England's bad books, as I told him so, whereas he was getting praise from most people at the launch of the coloured edition. After that, we parted company. One magazine I remember was Creel. Apparently it was taken over by angling. I think I wrote something for them, but I'm not sure. I know very little about Quill, or don't remember except when Bernard Vedables was the editor, and I think he was too expensive as an editor in some ways. I'll probably get shot for that, but he was off a board, and that would have been costly. That was before the maggot got going and was making money. I could be wrong, of course. Now, if I go back to angling, to quote Ernie Wise, that what I wrote was liked. Originally it was Ken Mansfield who asked me to write for angling. That was in 67 before Brian Harris. But it was Brian who wanted me as a regular. 
and as I've already said, why I knew that I would write about things politicians might not like. For example, although some of the waters ruined by the Industrial Revolution were cleaned up to a certain extent, other problems weren't going away, continual dredging, abstraction, many thousands of pollutions from so many sources. I could go on and on. After all, ever since man of necessity lived by or near water, it would be his waste disposal unit as well as his source of drink. Listening to this, if you haven't already turned me off, you've probably already gathered that I'm basically a coarse angler, and many of the methods I've used for coarse fishing I also use for game fishing. But I was a bit political too. I wrote about the need for a national licence and that came about. I was appalled at the horrors of dredging. One article I wrote about dredging, called I Ruddy Nye Cried, was strongly taken up by NASA, or NASG, I can't remember which they were back then, and they bought any unsold coppers and sent those coppers to various authorities, and I was told they sent one to Prince Philip as well. Anyway, I'd been writing for angling for ten years when that too was sold. The new owners were based at a place awkward to get to for Brian Harris, so he suggested he could work at their offices for three days each week, and for the rest of the week work at home but they didn't want that. They wanted them to work the full week at their premises, which would have involved too much time travelling, so Brian thought he was compelled to resign. By then, Brian and I had become very good friends, and him leaving somehow made me feel I should pack it in too. There were several reasons for that, though, apart from Brian leaving, and for one, I'd already said, I think, somewhere, I wrote for the money, not for the recognition. Wasn't great pay and I doubt one could live on it, but it paid for all our fishing. And by the time Brian left angling, I didn't need the money anyway. I'd just then bought a stretch at Romsey of the River Test, and that entailed a lot of hard work to make it into a good fishery. And Dennis, my partner, was ill, so the shop was the main thing. The business was the most important thing, and with Dennis no longer putting in the necessary time, my workload in the business increased somewhat. Even so, Sandy Leventon, who took over the angling magazine for a while, asked me to carry on. And when Bruce Bourne joined angling, he rang me several times to ask me to continue writing for it. Angling Times also rang me and asked me to write for them full time when they heard I'd left the angling magazine. I must have been popular then. While I'm talking about my contribution to angling literature in the form of articles, as far as books are concerned, I've already said that I was asked to write my first two books, the one on carp in 1954, and then on Rocha Decord or so later. Regarding the carp book, in Kevin Clifford's History of Carp, he says it was the first technical book solely about carp. I've also written my autobiography, put some of my course fishing articles into a book, and some of my salmon and trout articles into a book, but those three books were put together since I was 80. After all the articles and my autobiography, I considered new books from me would be dishonest, because I'd already written almost all that I know in articles, so with the two books after my autobiography, as they were a collection of my articles, anglers already knew before they bought the things that it wasn't new stuff. Mind you, some readers have told me that some of my writing was before its time, if you know what I mean, and is still relevant today. Also at my age, I'm quite happy to throw away any false modesty, as you must have realised by now the way I'm talking about myself, but only a few people knew that the great Dick Walker told me that my name was down to be a member of his carp catchers club, but be quite honest, I didn't give a stuff about that, so never followed it up. And as I've thrown away any modesty, I can say that in one of his letters, Barry Rickards wrote that I was much underrated. He also said it was because Walker dominated the fishing scene, and if you weren't one of his group, well, I think he said cronies, well, you know. The name of Sandy Levington, who has been years now, editor of Trout and Salmon magazine, has triggered that going back to salmon, back in 1990, my little fishery was the first fishery to return all our salmon to the river, despite the fact that many keepers opposed to it, saying they would die. 
I think that was why the NRA, or was it the EA then, I can't remember, asked me to catch salmon for them for their tagging and tracking, and for inserting the electronic tracking devices into their stomachs. I also caught a lot of salmon for their broodstock programs. Only one died, as far as I know, and an article I wrote for Trout and Salmon since Leviton took over was about the fact that salmon did survive after being caught. That article was quoted at a salmon meeting arranged by, again, the NRA, the EA, in Winchester. It was about the decline of salmon in southern rivers. Since those days, nearly all salmon are returned. While I'm on about angling journalism, I don't think it's as good as it was, or perhaps I'm prejudiced. But when pictures of an ordinary float is printed, or split shot and so on, it makes one wonder if some of the pics are fillers. Each month there's the same anglers catching their monster carp and barbel, many that they've sometimes caught several times in the past, and some of the carp boys catch barbel with almost the same gear they use for carp, including buzzers. Perhaps I'm just old-fashioned, I don't want to hear buzzers in the day, or when I'm by the river even if I stay an hour or two in the dark. I think ordinary fishing has declined a bit, although I'm sure the average angler is still happy to catch moderate fish. Mind you, one of David Hall's mags writes about just fishing, as well as articles about the commercials and match lot. Apart from that magazine, so much writing is almost the same. There will be an argument about that view, I bet, but I know lots of anglers who won't buy angling magazines because they say they're all the same always. Looking back over angling publishing to the 1960s and beyond, which we both can do, much has changed with regard to production quality and illustration, helped to no small degree by digital photography and word processing. But change isn't always for the better, particularly with regard to content and today's articles looking more like prescriptive instruction lists handing out instant success on a plate, as opposed to drawing the reader into a particular situation and allowing him or her to pick out a few pointers and serve something of an angling apprenticeship. <laughs> well, I think that's so true. <laughs> Mind you, there's wonderful photography now in the digital age, and I've already mentioned my thoughts about the same anglers doing the same things, even though successfully. But compared to now, we had crap tackle with very little information, so we had to teach ourselves so much. Some youngsters these days would certainly have lost the learning curve that we older anglers went through, as you so aptly put it, an angling apprenticeship. Personally, I think it's a pity, as kids can start now by catching fish of a size we could only dream about. So what have they got to look forward to? But in truth, the basis of angling is so simple. Fish have to eat. So give them something they like in a presentable way that doesn't scare them to death and you should catch. Mind you, I've known some very clever people that find it very hard to grasp the simplicity of fishing and therefore will never be good at it. I could be wicked here and say they take up fly fishing. I've upset a few fly fishing friends by saying how easy that branch of the sport is, especially trout when they're all banged on the head so they never had the chance to learn. But fishing the dry fly, everything is in your favour. Fishing the nymph is far more skilful, and obviously those that have an ability, and dare I say a good hunter's talent for nature, will obviously do better at fly fishing as they would at any other form of the sport. However, I think there's so much more to learn to catch course fish successfully, such as watercraft, reading a river's currents for example, the necessary features that are attractive to certain species, all the methods and baits, Success in course fishing is dependent on so many things, and even still waters require a knowledge of the different methods needed for certain species, their habitat preferences also, so many things. That makes course fishing so much more interesting to me than fishing with the fly. OK, so you can catch every species on a fly, but conditions need to be pretty good for that, whereas a good course angler can catch fish in most conditions. To elaborate a bit more, I could use my example of my early fishing on the tidal Thames. You had to learn to fish all states of the tide, with the changing depths and constant current variations, and nearly everyone float fished back then anyway. Now, even on the tidal, many anglers are leathering. I think we've learned what we learned then is almost lost with so few anglers fishing the float. 
Lettering does simplify it somewhat. But I guess modern anglers are after big fish all the time. Of course, there's so many changes with all our lives due to technology, communication and the modern means of travel. Even when I was younger, I could only fish local waters. Long trips meant travelling by train or going on the club coach. So you were limited in many ways with the ability to get anywhere very far. Unlike now when we all have cars. Going back before my time, some did get around, but they had to be rich anglers with the time available to travel by train. And then it might be by a horse, of course. As I didn't drink and hardly smoked, I got a motorcycle and the car at 21. There were only three cars in my road, and that was a road with over 200 people. Milk, bread, coal, all that was still delivered by horse and cart. Although in the past men of means could travel around for salmon, trout or pike or whatever, and because of the travel difficulties could afford to stay at hotels, inns or whatever accommodation was close to their fishing, nowadays you don't have to be rich to be able to get the waters almost anywhere, even abroad. So many anglers can afford to join syndicates, get time off, or even rarely work so that they have almost unrestricted time. So now we have anglers that can almost buy success. It doesn't mean they're not damn good anglers, but they have the means to get their PBs or whatever at any cost. When I think back to when I was young, during the war nobody had a holiday. And even afterwards most jobs were five and a half days a week. Apart from bank holidays or church days, some of them only got one week off each year. I only got one day off a fortnight as we opened the shop on Sunday and my partner and I shared them. I did get a full day off each week in the close season, though. I think I already mentioned that. But these days, workers seem to have endless time off. If that sounds like sour grapes, it bloody well is. Earlier in this interview, I mentioned the problems that existed in our waterways, and still do. And owing to the degradation of many rivers, not just the water quality, but also as there's overpredation by... Cormorants and otters. The result of all this being that many anglers who might have fished rivers have moved to fishing still waters. There are gravel pits, reservoirs, lakes and ponds, and for some the huge natural lakes and locks where anglers have always spent their time. So there's a wealth of still waters to choose from. I just said natural lakes. So I don't know any still waters that have not been created by man, either by digging sand, gravel, clay or whatever, or by damming streams. In recent times, perhaps also owing to the degradation of rivers that I just mentioned, there have been quite small ponds dug simply for commercial reasons. Like most of the others, I suppose, really. Anyway, these have been dug to stock with fish for anglers at a price, and some of them have been pretty successful at giving anglers quite a variety of fish, although many of them are filled with carp, some huge. Some of the match boys, fishermen, have a huge catch of carp, running into hundreds of pounds weight of these fish, and equally winning hundreds of pounds. Whether people like me prefer running water to fish them or not, they have their place, and with the future population increase that is foreseen, and highly likely, still waters may be all that will be left to anglers with rivers abstracted almost dry. An exaggeration? Who knows? People will come before fish, and most of them will still want to wash their bloody cars, but the demand for water must increase as the population increases. It's obvious, even to idiots. Of course, I too like fishing still water for pike, tench, perch and stuff. It's just that I have a preference for rivers and streams. I suppose what I've just talked about could lead me to considering that it was fishing in still waters for their carp that probably started the specimen movements, and fishing for carp and monster carp which can be started with very young, was partly due to the loss of the learning carb my generation had when we were young. Of course, the specimen game moved to many other species, and as it is now possibly so comfortable when fishing, and many anglers have so much time, they are happy to spend a lot of that time doing nothing, just waiting for a bite, hoping it's a whopper. Even the younger ones are probably not too bored, if allowed or the sound is kept down, or they use earphones, they can have the telly, radio, games, phones, iPods, or laptops, and with bolt rigs and buzzers they don't even need to concentrate or fish, all they have to do is wind them in. 
This has also allowed unknowledgeable anglers to be successful at catching monsters, as even the tackle is so strong that guys and gals who ain't that good at rod handling still get them in. Fixed ball reel and old design now, well almost as old as me, has made casting so easy that distant swims are within reach from the bank. These swims wouldn't even have been considered without the availability of a boat when I was young. Some of these anglers who think they are good live back when I was hatched. I doubt their ability at general angling would have got many big fish. Then again, I suppose it is understandable that so many anglers in this day and age are after carp. They are available everywhere as there are few waters without them. They grow large. They fight pretty well. And it's also understandable anglers want to catch big fish that are so easily available. And that's the point, unlike when I was young. The waters weren't available then unless you were local. And I've already said how anyone can get anywhere to fish for anything in this modern world. As for the carp scene, I may be partly to blame. From the late 1950s, Kay and I were giving film shows to many, many clubs around London, and Kay and I would travel a long way too to give shows to the new specimen groups and other clubs within 100 miles. Anglers were seeing carp and other fish, not large now, but then they were, and I was advising many of them to stock with carp if they wanted big fish. The only opposition to that were the match boys, who would complain that if an angler looked at carp in a match, it might run around all over the place and mess up other anglers' swims. There's no doubt, though, that fishing for carp now helps to keep the tackle trade alive, and I've already tackled that a bit when I said that if rivers don't return, what else but still water, carp, etc. Kay and I gave up on carp many years ago when it got too popular, and our quiet waters start to get too busy. We still had our carp fish in the spring, though, by going to Canada. We started that also because our spring salmon were becoming almost non-existent where we fished. That carp fishing is helping to keep coarse fishing alive is without doubt, and the opening of still waters throughout the year, and not closing for three months as they used to, must also help in some areas. As I have just said, can I travel abroad for carp in the closed season? But there is an increasing number of anglers travelling aboard to fish for carp, even larger than those within our shores, and they're pretty monstrous now. But it is now possible for even moderate earnest to travel to distant shores, and so an increasing number of anglers are aiming their sights at all sorts of freshwater species, and sea fishing aboard too for the many species in the sea. Fishing aboard is continually getting converts, even those with limited means. As far as writing about those experiences, editors, even of totally coarse fishing material, seem happy to put them into print. Some of the regular writers sometimes fish aboard, and any articles evolving from that are usually accepted too. Being an all-rounder, and learning your fishing skills at a time when information availability was not at present-day saturation levels, obviously generates a much higher degree of experience and expertise. So now might be a good point to talk us through some of your personal angling apprenticeship. I've already informed the listener that I grew up on the tidal Thames, which gave me a great apprenticeship with the currents and tides to contend with, and that I mostly fished the float, as most anglers did, but also ledged and paternostered. By the age of twelve, perhaps before, I was really into the paternosters, as I found so many advantages on my tidal Thames. And as I got older and got my motorbike in 1949 and was fishing for all species, I found the method so useful for almost everything, except when float fishing, of course, which is still my favourite form of fishing. As a youngster, I fished at Ambits for Bream, the Royal Parks for Tentral, where there were carp, the River Crane at the top of the tidal bit and several other venues. My great-aunt who raised me bought me a bike as a present for passing the scholarship at ten and gaining a free place, so that gave me a much bigger area to fish. I would fish the Thames up to Sunbury, where I fished with weed paddling below the weir and caught hundreds of big roaches by that method. In fact, I would collect weed and use it all over the place in ordinary areas, and it worked for roach a treat. I would also ride my bike to fish in the River Colne, a longish ride past where Heath Row is now. Later in life, I drove to the same area to get maggots from Frank Murgit, who had a maggot factory there. 
That reminds me, I won a fiver from him. That's another story. In those days, I didn't have a dad who fished, and there were few big names like today in Max to Reed. So I had to teach oneself. We kids started at the bottom. That's not a good idea when learning to swim. And although I read a lot, it wasn't in fishing books. During the two years that I was in hospital between the ages of 17 and 19, I read practically all the books brought round by the volunteer ladies, but there was nothing about fishing. But some fishing literature did come my way then, as the great aunt who reared me from the age of five used to visit every week and bring me the Fishing Gazette. I think I've already said that I caught my first salmon when fishing with Barbel, but if I haven't, that's when I caught it. But when I joined the Red Spinner Angling Society in 1953 and found there were salmon sometimes in one of their waters, although as nobody seemed to catch them, I soon found suitable methods and my favourite pattern of the techniques for course fishing came in very helpful for fishing the Devon Minnow and later in the season when prawn and shrimp became legal. The paternoster was a great way to present them, I tell you. Also, I'd done a lot of spinning for pike and perch and chubbing river and lake by then, so I knew how to work baits and at what speeds, and so in any way I caught a lot of salmon. When writing for angling, Brian Harris and I soon became friends, and he took a salmon rod at Wingwood, so I joined him and took one too. During the close season, it enabled us to get a couple of days fishing as we shared each other's beat. I managed it as only after business by then I took my partner into us having an extra day off once a fortnight. A little later, I also took him into us having a week off during that period too. As with Sunday opening, we took the days off in turn, although once the season opened, that was stopped of course. However, although I could only use my salmon day once a fortnight, I was fishing on Harris's beat on the day that he couldn't go, and I caught a fish of 39 and a half pounds. But I recorded it at 39 pounds. Anyway, it was difficult to be set to the half pound thing with close scour division. I don't think Brian's ever forgiven me for that. My first 30 pound of those 32 and a half pounds, I certainly grabbed the half pound then. After all, it was my first 30. That came from the stour. And of course the Avon Springers are just the same, big and beautiful. And then, like the Stour, were really under 15 or 16 pounds. Many huge ones over 40 pounds had come from the Avon and Stour for many years before I caught that. But when I fished, they no longer came into the river. And there hasn't been one since my big fella. That makes me wish I'd not caught my friend a gaffer, as he may then have made the 40. Fancy being the last angler still alive to catch a 40 pound Avon salmon. Still, mustn't be greedy. Ha! Ah. Talking about the Avon, when we were young, Kay and I and friends, customers and protégés, who would take fishing with us, fish the famous royalty a bit, and they have a little museum there with many pictures of huge salmon. Many 40s up the Avon record of 49, and that's some fish, I tell you. They also have a picture of me and friend Johnny Leonardi with a catch at Barbel and Chubb in 1952, I think it was, and of Kay with a good-sized sea trout. I'm real chuffed at that as they describe Kay as the greatest female angler in history. Going back to my early days of fishing when I was a child, as a kid I started going fishing at about the age of six when my aunt let some older boys take me. It's my personal opinion that it was much better then, especially for kids. We learnt to fish by catching small stuff, and we had stacks of fun catching tiddlers, even sticklebacks and minnows, and a bit bigger like loach, gudgeon, little roach, little perch, dace and bleak. And we soon learnt to catch sizeable fish, not the monsters of today, but fish over the size limit. They were called goers, and we usually killed them. Not just we kids. Nearly all anglers killed their catches, I've already talked about the lack of transport, so it was club coaches everywhere. But unless someone was lucky enough to have a dad who fished and would take you on the Sunday coach trip, no way. The club coach, of course, is long since a thing of the past. I mentioned that some anglers have named me as their mentor. Wouldn't that have been great to have a mentor? Apart from dads, most we kids had to teach ourselves practically everything. Well, I didn't have a mentor, of course I did watch other anglers. Angling papers like the Angling Times, or the type of magazine we have today, they just didn't exist. 
There was the Angler's News and the Fishing Gazette, but as kids we never saw those, or we may have learned something. From 19, I was in the tackle trade. That owned a hell of a lot of opportunities. Many club members in my area were customers, and they asked me to join. That gave me a lot of fishing for many species, and I've already said that I cut my teeth learning about salmon in a club water, but even that I had to teach myself as none were being caught. In a way, it was the close season that started that game, and sea fishing. In fact, I wonder if I'd have got into it so much if the season had been open all year on still waters as now. I expect so, salmon fishing anyway. I knew they were there. You'd see them jump sometimes, so I had to catch them, didn't I? From my chat, I hope I've conveyed the fact that Kay and I loved every type of angling, with none really taking precedence. We followed the seasons, or when we thought were the best times to pursue a certain species, or when it was available to us like spring salmon, or sea fishing when we were on holiday or had a full day off from business. As I've got old though, although my fishing has not really changed, having been there, done it, got the t-shirt sort of thing, now I have the time, it's no longer such an obsession, if that's the right word, as it never came before K or our business, but I suppose there are days that would be nice to have again. Dream on. I suppose a special day was my £30 salmon. So it wouldn't a £40 be something. Although in Canada and Alaska carried the Pacific species to over £40, and I had them to £51, as I've already said, with loads of 20s and 30s. I remember a sea fishing trip, a holiday in fact, with John and Arlene Goddard, Les and Dora Moncrief, you remember the Moncriefs? They were, uh, Les Moncrief was uh, into that long casting lark, but in fact he became quite famous for that, for the beat. Anyway, when we were out there, uh, nobody caught much, but Kay caught a big hammerhead, I think it was about 169 or something, although John and Les questioned the scales that they both thought was over 200 pounds. Anyway, it was 20 years before I caught a hammerhead, and uh, unbelievably I was only using 20 pound breaking stone, but this was estimated by the guys at 500 pound, and God, I put it at least 450. The banter before and after between Kay and I made that a special fish, but as it took three and a quarter hours to beat the fish, I don't think I'd want that again. The low breaking strain made it possible to win only because we were fishing inside of the reef. Outside in the sea proper, it would never have been landed. As it was, the skipper said we followed it for over ten miles. Catching fish on a stupidly low breaking strain reminds me of coarse fish that might be called memorable. I was fishing the tidal Thames with friend Tony Myatt and landed a twenty-two and a half pound carp on two pound line. And when grailing fishing in the throne with a two pound hook link, I landed a carp that could easily have been twenty-five pound. As I was after grailing, I only had scales weighing up for eight pounds. Of course, we had plenty of practice at playing landing fish on light hook links. On the royalty, we had to sometimes get down at two pounds stuff to get a bite especially when maggots were the dominant bait. You could watch the fish pick up loose feed, but never pick up the bait unless we had a very, very fine hook link. Of course, we got criticised a lot for that, but we had a lot of practice at one time in fishing for grailing, as the damn salmon, sometimes over £20, would keep grabbing our maggots. Even here on my water last year, five salmon were taken on bread by my friends when trotting for roach. And all were landed, and I don't suppose any of them were using hook links heavier than three pound. Mind you, I guess I've lost some fish that would have been special, a possible forty pound salmon on my own bit of the river test here, and a pike probably over thirty pound on the Aaron. I got a huge sea trout that I reckon was probably fifteen pounds about three years ago from my own water, but I didn't have scales or camera with me, and as I didn't want to leave the fish in the landing net while I went back to the house to get them, I'll never really know, but I'm pretty good at guessing salmon weight, so I don't think I would have been much out. I suppose another special fish was my best perch. That was four and a quarter. Nice fish. But what was really special about it was that that came from my own water. Compared to today's sizes of fish, none of K's or my fish would be great. Nevertheless, we both caught the biggest recording from some waters when we were fishing them. When carp fishing at the time, I had the largest, and Kay got the biggest ever take from another watery carp fish back in the 50s. Apart from that water which was filled in, 
All the other venues have since produced much, much bigger fish. We've caught 30s and I had a 40, but they were from Canada. We've also caught many species of sea fish in excess of 100, 200 and 300 pounds. But they were only babies for their species, and that includes three species of marlin and several species of sharks, although I did get the big hammerhead. In freshwater, K had several sturgeon over 100 and at least three over 200, and I got up to 300. And although they too are babies for their species, to us it was great fishing as we caught plenty of them. Great sport. I lost my K almost seven years ago, so I also lost my fishing companion, my best friend, and a lady who gave me a wonderful life and marriage. But that didn't mean that life had to end for me too. After a small stroke 14 years ago, we talked of death, but not in an unhappy way, as we wanted each other to still enjoy life after the other had gone, and I still do, as I know Kay would have done if I'd gone first. And so I still fish, not with the same intensity, but still with the same enjoyment. I also enjoy the successes of my many friends who fish here, as many have caught PBs here, roach, trout, salmon, chub, dace, grayling, even gudgeon. I suppose Kay and I were lucky, as we never needed to chase those so-called specimens to enjoy our fishing, so neither of us ever had a goal that we never achieved, so we were very happy always. My only regret is that I wish I'd kept up with the piano, as I would have been a good pianist, but I really lost it when I was in hospital for those two years, and later for another spell over over five months, so I stopped playing for over 40 years till Kay bought me a piano from his 65th birthday. Friends tell me I still play well, but I'm rubbish to what I was as a teenager, but one can only do so much in life. For example, when Kay and many friends asked me to write another fishing book, perhaps an autobiographical, I kept putting it off even though Kay bought me a word processor. After she died, I felt I'd let her down, so I got into gear and wrote Minos to Marlin, and that was the book I believe Kay wanted me to write, autobiographical. I've been told by a few people, as well as a fishing book, it's a slab story. Some anglers told me it made them laugh, but also made them cry. That must be the chapter devoted to my Kay. In that book, as it's about my life, I write about the things I'm most proud of, and apart from K, it's beating the authorities and winning three public inquiries and helping to win a fourth. I will talk about that elsewhere, but the Minnow's book was kept to a small print at 5.50, as a new fishing book is seemingly printed about every five minutes and the market's flooded with the damn things. Friends of mine who've written books and had a bigger print never seem to sell them all. With my book, all the leathers were sold before being printed. We sold almost half of the hardbacks at the book launch, and the book was sold out in less than three months. The publican who entertains many of these book launches told me it was the best launch he'd ever had. Apart from all the car parks being full, cars were parked for about a quarter of a mile up the road. I was amazed, as I'd stopped writing seriously over 35 years before, so I did not expect such a great launch. What the book has done, though, has put me back on the fishing scene again somehow, I think, as even though I thought all the old fogies like me, who might know me, and some of the younger one and the middle ones seem to know me now, middle-aged ones, that is, seem to know me now a bit. Obvious to you and I, though less so perhaps to younger people who've never known any different, there's been a lot of changes to the angling scene over the past 50 or more years, and not always for the good. So can you talk us through some of the changes you've observed, starting with coarse fishing? The way fishing has changed, in my humble opinion, is mainly due to two things which I've already talked about, the main one being the availability of a means to transport an angler anywhere in the country or even the world. As I said earlier, when I started fishing, milk was delivered to one's home by horse and cart, the baker's wares, Fuel for fires and stoves, mostly coal and coke, was delivered by all drawn carts, which was the only way to heat the home. Certainly the ordinary household didn't have central heating, and neither did most of the larger properties. There were a few firms that were starting to use petrol power, but that only really took off for the household goods delivered directly to homes after the war. And I'm talking about the Second World War, 
It's understandable, really, as the horse would stop at every house. It knew the routes and every stop, so the milkman only had to walk from the doorstep to his cart and back. If he'd been in a motor vehicle, he couldn't keep stopping at every house, so he would have had to carry the goods a lot further over the course of a day. The advent of the electric vehicle was what really led to the demise of the horse, I guess. But to emphasise it again, when I was a youngster, anglers could only fish where they walked to, cycled to, or where the club coach took them to at weekends. Of course, really keen anglers used their annual holidays to fish somewhere special and try to arrange it around family commitments. The Royal Dick Christchurch was a holiday venue for barbell anglers mostly, but now one can pop down for a day. The ease of travel all came about during my early years of fishing, but anglers now accept it all as normal, of course. The second thing that has changed fishing for some anglers is communication due to technology. The modern phone can tell guys where fish are being caught, even as they are being caught, and some of the specimen anglers chase around for the chance of also catching whatever. That would be impossible to do when I was young. But as I hardly smoked or drank and could afford the motorbike and then the car, and I think I've already said there were 200 of all people in my road and only three cars, and one of them was mine. Now that road has been made into a one-way street as there's so many cars either side. Mind you, technology has given us wonderful tackle, and there are far less fish lost by competent anglers as even the fine stuff is so strong. Ways are unbelievable, and even the cheaper carbon rod types are better than the best split cane of my day, saying that will cause a fuss, but I know that's true. I used to smile when some of my customers would tell me they had a great day's fishing. They'd caught a nice bag of ocean dust and been broken up three times, had a wonderful day. They thought it was great to be broken up, as it means they looked something special. When I chatted about me being on the carp scene so many years ago, I don't think I mentioned my friend Fred Wilton. Many years ago, Fred became a visitor to my tackle shop, and he makes me smile when he tells me the tale of his mate being excited because it was Dave Stewart serving him. They didn't know I worked in a tackle shop. He wanted a new rod, and had eyed one up he thought would suit him. He says he still can't get over the fact that I sold him a much cheaper rod, which I'd thought better than what he asked for. It was on a hollow glass, and he has it still. Now, I'm not telling you what it was. Ask Fred. But he came in the shop once, very disillusioned with fishing, and was going to give it up. Apparently, I talked him out of it. That was before his high-protein baits, and if he had given up fishing, I wonder how long it would have been before someone else made mixes and also boiled them. I think I'm writing saying Richworth were the first firm that came into being making boilers commercially. Their name, of course, was made up for the names of Clyde Dietrich and Malcolm Winkworth. Malcolm used to come into my shop driving me absolutely bonkers when he was talking for hours about amino acid, casein, and all the stuff needed to make his boilies. Incidentally, he'd asked me several times about taking in salmon fishing, but I had said he would find it boring. He could be fishing the river, and there might not be a single fish in the beat. I said, at least you know the carp are there, wherever you're fishing. Anyway, I did take him, and it just happened to be the day I caught my 39-pounder. He never took it up, though, but the poor man had diabetes and an early death. I still see Fred Wilton now and again, though, although he lives in Hereford, and he's still playing about with different recipes, but his face still work. I suppose Fred was a bit responsible for the specimen scene today, and the rich with boys as boilies and the means to use me efficiently rather hairy. It's got to be the specimen hunter's biggest asset. Richie MacDonald was a customer and he came into the shop once and said, Got any pound baking stain, Dave? Do me a favour, Dave. Don't tell anyone I bought this, will you, mate? Because it was for the early hair rigs. It's not exactly hair anymore, though, is it? <laughs> Although Kay and I were never specimen hunters, obviously we also used boilies at times. Although our early carp baits were bred in various forms, worms, braggots and potatoes. Kay did like the fish with the big species, great for me, but she was also happy enough catching smaller species. But to stir me up, Kay would call them bait, even a two-pound roach. You say that would make a nice pike bait for a big fish. I don't really have a favourite species, but if I did, one of my favourites would certainly be roach. 
Mind you, there's plenty of two pounders in my bin of river, and I've no idea how many I've caught, but I've only got to walk out the door to fish with a good possibility of catching one, so obviously I know my own water. I know how many salmon I've caught here, though as I've had to record them by law. I won't give a figure, but I will say it's several hundred, and a lot elsewhere. I was always happy to be alone, and still am, although I have lots of friends, but with Kay I had a fishing mate for life, of course. Although carp, sturgeon, and catfish are now the largest species in our country, I still have a thing for salmon and pike, as when I was young, they were our largest species, and still are our largest indigenous species. And although I keep harping back to when I was young, I can't hop forwards, can I? Our things have changed. Big fish were gaff, so not be turned to get bigger pike and salmon, and perhaps some don't know that Bob Richards gaffed his big red mire carp, you know, red mire, what burneth and caught really, but they, I think it was Walker first named it red mire. Anyway, the care of fish now is very good, though, compared to the likes of Walker and me. In one publication, there's a picture of Walker with a couple of carp held up by fingers through the gills. Possible the fish were dead, as fish were nearly always killed then. Yep, I still have a thing for pike. One of my articles in the Fishing Gazette way back in 1956 showed how to fish deep water for pike with float paternoster tackle. Also discussed sunken floats, single hooks instead of trebles, rotten bottoms, proper pike rods as there weren't any then, although we made 10 and 12 footers in my shop from 1951, I think. Anyway, when I wrote the article of the Fishing Gazette, I thought I'd devised it all as no pike anglers that I saw ever used the methods, except the friends and customer friends who had shown it to, who fished with me, obviously. The few pike anglers I saw used crew pike gear, and no pike anglers back then ever wrote about the Paternoster method. They wrote about using pike bungs or spinning. Even Barry Rickards didn't know of it until he got it from my friends in the mid-sixties, that was 14 or 15 years after I was using it. In fact, he gave me a great deal of credit for rediscovering it, and I thought it was all my ideas. Apparently, sometime after he had learned of it from my friends, he found a book by a chap called Hill, who wrote about it in the 1940s. 1940s. It was about 1943 that I made my first pattern for bite. Very crude, but I was only 14. But by 1949 and 1950, I'd pretty well perfected it. Well, I was working then in a fishing tackle shop, so I had access to all sorts of tackle, giving me ideas about lots of angling techniques. However, recent historians of angling have found that the float paternoster was the method used by knowledgeable pike anglers in the 1800s, and even farther back than that. And today, so much of what anglers think is new, even I knew way back, they think the helicopter rig is fairly new. It's only a form of paternoster. Until this year of 2014, I did think the sunk float paternoster was mine, and using a loose sliding float above for some situations. But even that form of fishing apparently goes back a long way in time. But I'm still sure the float link rig for fishing still waters is mine, as I wrote about it when I was lead writer of Angler's Mail. It was designed originally to combat drift, but it was also useful for other reasons too, especially when fishing deep water. Fred Buller has it in one of his books, written two years after my article, but he says he thinks he was the first to write of it. But by an amazing coincidence, he's named the method what I originally called it, the float link method. Anyway, to get back to pike, I did design multi hook pike tackles for instant hooking, so pike never swallowed the bait, could be returned to the water. Walker was not the only angler who wanted them killed. Many anglers killed pike when they caught them. The much-used Jardine-type snap tackle was awful, as it had huge hooks, one o's, two o's, even three o's. But all my tackles, including my Jardine-type, were made with much smaller hooks, eight sixes or occasionally fours. And the much smaller trebles, although ma manufacturers' pike tackles had the huge hooks, they are made with smaller ones now. Rickards told me he scowled down after seeing my friend's tackles. For deep water, I designed pike floats that could be drifted out to deep water, and then a good pull of the line would release it to go down to whatever depth the stop had been placed on the line. I adapted that from sea floats. I think Barry Rickards and his friends used to fish for Xander, which had been introduced in 1963. 
There was a fear that they would decimate small fish and consequently ruin waters, especially for matchmen. Don't know much about them, but they haven't caused the damage expected, apparently. Not like cormorants or otters. Last year I recorded an interview with Mike Healing, chairman of the British Record Fish Committee, in which I asked him why the Welsh catfish had been suspended from the record list. In the main, this was due to illegal imports to restricted fisheries, creating, amongst other things, an artificial record situation. He then went on to say that it was British Record Fish Committee policy to campaign for the removal of all alien species, not only from the record list, but also from the country, and that, controversially, would also include the carp. Well, if they wanted to um, chuck all the fish out and that, where would it stop? Would they also include removing barbel from many rivers? After all, they're not indigenous to many rivers. They were only originally in rivers flowing east. I mean, if you go back far enough, where it joined the Rhine system. It would be difficult to remove all alien species anyway, and in many cases it'd be damned unpopular. And they're here, and give many anglers pleasure. If it's that much of a problem for those who worry about records, leave the non-indigenous species off the list. Walker's carp would have had to go, I guess. Mind you, we seem to accept foreign footballers and cricketers and so on. Is it worth worrying about a few fish? Anyway, it's not going to happen. Of course, if we ever get a dictatorship, who knows? <laughs> That's about all I'm going to say about that, I think. As the next run of questions takes us away from what has been predominantly a coarse fish bias part of your life, now might be a good natural break point before we explore your sea and game fishing thoughts in a little more detail. So for now, it's a very big thank you to the legend that is Dave Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> 